All right, everyone, uh, welcome to tonight's event, Building an Equitable Education System. I'd like to send a warm welcome to our attendees joining us today. My name is Caitlin, and I'm happy to be your panel discussion leader and host for tonight's event. I'm a member of ELN, or the Emerging Leaders Network of Executive Committee, where I serve as one of the programming leads. This event is one I, which is of particular relevance to me, as I'm currently finishing up my PhD at the University of Toronto. Whether you're new to the ELN community or an active member, we're happy to have you join us here tonight. So I'd like to transition into our agenda slide. I'll be spending the next 10 minutes providing you with an introduction to tonight's event and panelists. From there, we will transition into a structured panel discussion where we, we will ask our four panelists questions that we have prepared. And then we'll transition into the our audience um, panel discussion, whereby you'll have an opportunity as an attendee at tonight's events to submit questions that you have for our panelists. And with that, we're, we're excited to get this event started. Before we officially begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that I'm on today from Civic Actions Works. We recognize that with virtual events, folks may be joining us from different parts of the region or beyond. So please let us know where you're joining us from today in the chat. Civic Action acknowledges that the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area as well as, is situated upon traditional and current Indigenous territories that include the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and Mrs. Mrs. Sagas of Skugog, Island First Nation. We believe that in the spirit of the dish with one spoon concept, that land can be shared to the mutual benefit of all its inhabitants. Today, the greater Toronto and Hamilton area is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we recognize the histo historical oppression and inequalities that they may continue to face. We also recognize that the, no the non-settlers and the displanted, such as the people of African descent who were brought here forcibly and enslaved and who continue to face oppression and inequality on land that is not their own. Depending on our ancestry, we each have different relationships to the land on which we live. In our role as a civic convener and in the sphere of reconciliation, civic action is committed to rebuilding and renewing respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We support Indigenous sovereignty, and we support the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. All right, so before we get started, I'd like to cover some admin for tonight's event. So we are excited to have you participate, and we recommend that you use the chat box to share comments, ideas, resources, or links, or to ask for assistance with any troubleshooting. We'll be using Slido to gather audience questions for panelists. Click on the link that we'll provide you with in the chat or enter the event code 5825044. And in the Q&A tab, you can add your own questions or upload questions that you'd like to see asked that have been submitted by other attendees. Please don't wait till the actual um, Slido section of tonight's event. If a question comes up while our structured panel discussion is happening, feel free to submit it then. If you're experiencing technical difficulties while joining this event, a Civic Action staff member will support you with any tech issues. I'm gonna give a shout out here to Amon. Uh, so send a message to Amon underscore Civic Action in the chat and she'll try her best to help you out. If you'd like to use closed captioning for tonight's event, please click show subtitle under live transcript within your Zoom window to view that. All right. So tonight we hope to engage in an open discord surrounding equitable education. Post-secondary education plays a pivotal role in career, financial, and social advancement. However, not everyone in our region has equal access or experiences with higher education. In many ways, the pandemic has shown a light on the long-standing social, financial, and digital divides that disproportionately impact students in higher education systems. With this event, we aim to share, to shine a light on current issues with Ontario's post-secondary education system. We hope to generate discussion on ways it can be improved to create a greater or equitable system for all, and to also provide an opportunity to conduct you, you rising leaders in your community with our network of leaders from academia. 
Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from an incredible panel of four senior academic leaders who I have the pleasure of introducing you to. First, we have Sam Andre. Sam is the acting director of the Leadership Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University, a think tank dedicated to developing new ideas and solutions to most pressing civic challenges. He also teaches about public leadership and advocacy at Ryerson University and George Brown College. He previously served as chief of Chief of Staff and Director of Policy to Ontario's Minister of Education and the, in the Ontario Public Service and in the non-for-profit organization Advancing Equity in Education. Next, we would also like to welcome Andrew, C Andrew C. Persaud. Andrew is the Associate Director for Business Design Initiative, a research and education center at the Rotman School of Management, which focuses on design-led innovation management. A graduate of Rotman's MBA program, he is currently pursuing a doctorate in business administration at the Paris School of Business. He is a trained design, design thinking facilitator who holds a certificate in leading experience in design. In addition to his work at Rotman, Andrew provides, a private, provides private consulting for organizational innovation projects. He previously worked for over a decade at a large multinational corporation, building extensive experience in corporate strategy, planning, finance management, and partner relations management. In addition, he was actively involved in theater, having founded and led a successful theater company. Next, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Robin Bourgeois. Robin Bourgeois is a mixed race Nihash Esque or Cree woman whose Cree family comes from Treaty 8 or less, Lesser Slave Lake territory. She was born and raised in Slicks and Splatson territories of British Columbia and is, con is connected to her three children to the Six Nations of the Grand River. She is an associate professor in the Center for Women's and Education Studies at Brock, where her scholarly work focuses on Indigenous feminist voices against Indigenous women and girls and Indigenous women's political activism and leadership. She is currently serving at the university's acting vice provost Indigenous engagement. In addition to being an academic, Robin is also in, as involved as an activist, author, and artist. Finally, I'd like to welcome Helen Tewold. Helen works at the University of Toronto, where she leads the newly established Access Program Support Office with a tri campus mandate to support and enhance student initiatives across the institution. This office will play a key role in supporting Access Programming and sustainability. So specifically, the office will provide research, planning, and funding support to, visions, to divisions in the development and expansion of programming for students and communities that are underrepresented at the University of Toronto. Helen comes to the University from the Law, Found Law Foundation of Ontario, where she was the Director of Policy and Programs. Helen has over a decade of management experience designing, developing, and delivering evidence-based and data-informed public programs, policy responses, and system, systemic change innovations in higher education, employment, and skill development in partnership with Indigenous people and underrepresented communities. Prior to her work at the Foundation, Helen was a Senior Researcher and Manager of Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. She has also held management positions at George Brown College, Council of Educators of Toronto, City of Toronto, and the United Way of Toronto. Now with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists and kick off our structured panel discussion. We're hoping to engage with these leaders to provide an opportunity for them to share their insights and perspectives on hybrid learning models, navigating, and, navigating healing and reconciliation, and better supporting students from underrepresented and low-income communities. All right, so welcome to my panelists. We're so excited to have you here today. Um, so to open the discussion, I'd like to provide you with an opportunity to share what you view as the biggest inequalities with the post-secondary education system. Um, I'm just gonna go, so it's relatively structured. I'll go left to right across my screen. So maybe Sam, if you can start us off, followed by Andrew and then Robin and then Helen. Sure, uh, thanks uh, for having me and, and thanks for organizing uh, such a great important event. Um, 
Maybe I'll just start with um, some quick facts, uh, which just to kind of center the discussion. And I think, you know, we, I sh I'm sure we all share the goal of all uh, willing and qualified students being able to access Ontario's uh, post-secondary education system. And I think we know that's not the case uh, today, um, just as a few examples. So um, low-income students attend university at about half the rate of high-income students. Um, uh, indigenous students attend at about a third of the rate of non-Indigenous students. Uh, people with disabilities also about half uh, the rate of, of um, the total population. Um, and then also parents who's, uh, who went to university themselves, nearly all of their uh, children go on to university, 89%. Uh, parents who didn't, uh, it's about half. So, you know, there are big gaps uh, uh, across all sorts of, of demographics. Um, uh, and I think the other thing I would say is um, I'm going to talk more than my fair share tonight, probably about university. And I'll, I'll do that with some intention because I think um, Ontario sometimes gets um, trotted out as having a really uh, high proportion of, of people that go on to post-secondary education. Um, it, you know, it's among the highest in the world. Um, and that is all true, uh, but it really masks the fact that Ontario uh, has a very impressive amount of people that go on to college, um, you know, 29 percent of Ontario's um, adults uh, have a college credential uh, compared to just 7 percent uh, globally. Um, so Ontario's college system is doing great and it um, provides uh, a really important uh, you know, springboard for, for people. Um, but our university it sort of masks the fact that our university attainment rate is lower than, you know, in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and um, uh, is creates a lot of access barriers. Um, one of the things I am working on, I'm part of a coalition that's called CASE, the Coalition for Alternatives to Streaming and Education, which focuses on uh, streaming practices in K-12 education, where the, um, students are separated based on their perceived ability into academic and non-academic classes, which um, creates all sorts of inequities for, for Black, Indigenous, low-income uh, students. And we're uh, advocating for that for that to stop. I'm happy to talk more about tonight, but maybe I'll just leave it there. Uh, thanks, Sam. I think you uh, kicked off the stage there and provided some insight into some key issues, not only facing just um, education systems in general, but ones that are specific to Ontario. Uh, maybe, Andrew, you can add to that from your perspective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Caitlin. And thanks again to the team for organizing and extending this invitation. Um, so throughout tonight, I'll share a lot of my perspective, particularly from a point of the intersectionalities that I come with. So as somebody who initially migrated to Canada for my MBA, so as an immigrant um, and an international student, as a person of color and as a member of the GLBTQ plus community, um, I can only speak to, to, to my experience and that's what I can powerfully, powerfully speak to. So a lot of, just to give you the kind of heads up in terms of what I share is really comes from that perspective as a student, as, as a teacher within and, and a coach within the university setting. Um, so when I think about the inequities, um, three things pop up for me. So the first, which is representation in the classroom. Um, so, you know, either from professors and teachers, so starting there, so literally, who are the people teaching? But I think often too is the materials that we put in like case studies or guests that we have come who come into the classroom. Um, and I know I'm, with this group, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but like offering up, and it's so critical that we offer up those different perspectives and experiences to students so that they can learn from. Um, and, and recognizing that it's not easy, right? It's not always easy. So in our space of design and business, the intersection, the reality is there are comparatively fewer leaders um, from the indigenous and, and communities with people of color communities at a leadership level. And so it's tough, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to go out and find cases. Um, and sometimes we do make, we do have to make, manage the tensions between somebody who has multiple years of experience, you know, because we want to bring in the kind of most experienced person to interface and interact with our students versus somebody who has a really unique perspective. And so I think being really thoughtful about that, um, is really important from that equity perspective. The second one is, and 
an assumption of experience. So having a, a kind of a uniform assumption happening with experience. And what do I mean by that? Um, from Again, from the, the areas that I've worked, a lot of times um, courses, particularly at the master's level, tend to be designed, curriculum tends to be designed from a way that assumes some experience and ex assumes experience um, and, and they're built to kind of leverage and build off past experiences, professional experiences. Um, and I see, you know, I've seen many educators do that, right? And it's the, in, in, inherently it's not a bad thing, especially at higher levels of education, but it's when we are very narrow in terms of what that experience is. And we make assumptions around the uniformity and composition of our classrooms. Then of course, we're creating inequities in terms of the learning experience and, and the journey through our material. And the third one that really came to mind um, was around, <laughs> from a very functional perspective, poor course, cross course planning and how that impacts on students. So at the same time I was doing my MBA, uh, my partner was doing a program at OCAD and we were both constantly overwhelmed, you know, in terms of the number of, of assignments and, and things that you were, were committed to doing in school. Um, and it, meant that a lot of times you, you get focused on completion rather than learning. Um, we, in our situation, we were lucky. We, there were two of us in the home. You know, we were able to support on each other, kind of take, be emotional support and, and kind of life, you know, life support, taking care of the home, et cetera. But we know that's not going to be true for everyone, right? And so really that's, it's a huge amount of emotional stress that folks are going through financial stress in terms of, maybe having to manage a job or take on loans. And so when we think about our students in their, in their entirety of who they are, and not just a student in our course, but they are a student of all these courses and all these things that are happening around, I think as a system, um, education centers, universities, colleges, we can be more considered in terms of how we consider the totality of what we're offering up and putting on students' plates in any one semester or any one term and try to be a bit more thoughtful on how we balance that so that folks who have different circumstances outside of the classroom might have more chance of success in both. So that's it for me, Caitlin. Thanks, Andrew. I think you raised three very uh, unique issues and some that are, you know, different ones that, that Sam highlighted. Um, if we can pass it off to Robin now uh, to share her perspective. Sure, and thank you all for putting together this event and, and thank you to my co-panelists. I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. I'm going to be quite blunt, um, and this comes from my experience. I mean, I'm taught, uh, I trained in sociology and in social justice education. I have been a student, I have been a professor, and now I'm a senior administrator. So I'm coming at this and I'm going to be very blunt. The biggest challenge still uh, is that these institutions, despite uh, commitments to decolonization, reconciliation, EDI, still are still very much shaped by white supremacy, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, class exploitation, economic marginalization, uh, and ableism. And I see barriers everywhere. Um, they're at all levels. You know, we have students who don't feel safe on campuses because they're experiencing backlash, whether they're racialized folks, indigenous folks, you know, women, uh, queer folks, uh, folks with disabilities. These, these campuses are not necessarily safe spaces for so many of our students, nor are they for staff and faculty. I'm gonna be very clear on that. Um, I've had some pretty atrocious experiences over my last couple of years as acting vice provost indigenous engagement that nobody could have ever prepared me for. Um, and it makes me wonder, you know, how do we get more indigenous leaders in these positions? Well, you have to start by dealing with the toxic uh, uh, anti-indigenous racism and colonialism that I face every day in just the very nature of doing my job, right? Um, I think about the lack of representation in our universities. You know, we have a lot of groups doing cluster hires, but there's still, you know, a small number of Indigenous faculty members. In fact, at this point, I'm still the only tenured Indigenous faculty member at my university. Uh, we don't have staff representation and, and we're kept in enclaves, um, particularly for Indigenous folks, you know, we're in Aboriginal student services or, or we're working in my office. Um, we, I just see, you know, when I look at my students, I see them coming to me 
because of, you know, my openness to talk about these things, I see, you know, I, this, these are systems that for so many of them, they don't feel like they were designed for them. I see, you know, I'm thinking about single parents all the time who are coming and they're like, I don't even have childcare. Can I bring my kid to class? I'm thinking about my BIPOC students who are coming and telling me these horrifying stories about not only their experiences on campus, but the treatment by professors, the kinds of assignments they're getting, how they're having professors who are giving lectures and using derogatory language, you know, including the N-word still in 2022, right? Um, that they have TAs who don't understand. I'm thinking about my students who have accessibility needs that are being unmet, even though that's mandated by law. You know, I'm thinking about all of the students who are working three to five jobs just to go <laughs> to school and, and, and first generation students who don't have the cultural capital that other students have. You know, I remember I'm a first generation student and I had to take a summer off that cost me dearly. You know, my student loans will tell you that right now that I'm still fighting the payoff because I felt so behind. I didn't have the skills that other students had. And I think that those problems haven't gone away. We are trying really hard and we are trying to make changes within the system, but it's not happening fast enough. And it's not happening in ways that are necessarily meaningful. You know, we end up with policies and procedures in place that sometimes are then weaponized against those who are most disadvantaged within the education system. So I have to be honest, I'm, you know, despite being very much entrenched in this system, I am very deeply critical of this system. And I struggle every day watching how those dominant interlocking systems of, of oppression continue to um, structure accessibility to the university. And, you know, it's one of those amazing things because anybody who studies oppression knows that what happens is they don't necessarily go away. They just, they just morph and they become these new forms of oppression. And I think we have to be really vigilant because even in trying to do something good like promote decolonization, for example, and reconciliation, we sometimes set up situations that are even worse. So I think I will stop there, but that's really what I see as the biggest issue. It's still those social systems of oppression that structure access and not only access, but the entire structure of the university. And you know, we're trying, but it's it's not fast enough. Robin, thank you so much. As a student, I can relate to many of those issues. I think, especially since um, academic institutions are a tenure job, there's not a lot of standardization between like what the university is setting as an aim and then what professors actually deliver. Um, and I'd love to pick your brain later on like how to recognize uh, colonialism so that we can, we can call it out when we see it because it's not something that I even think rec like recognized in my day to day. Um, I thought I'd like to pass it off to Helen uh, to add anything maybe that we haven't covered or something that you think is one of the biggest inequalities that you've recognized in your work. Um, yeah, no, thank you uh, for the invite uh, to the panel and to the co-panelists who started off the conversation right on point. Um, Sam, thank you for, for outlining sort of the, the larger data picture. Uh, it's true, we're one of the most educated societies on earth. Um, and yet some really stubborn uh, gaps exist and, and threaten to persist if we don't um, have some really clear and, um, and bold interventions uh, for students that, you know, would other, otherwise not attend uh, post-secondary. Um, so, I mean, I completely agree with Robin um, in terms of, you know, and our universities, all of our institutions literally reflect the societies that they're based in. And so um, they're mutually constitutive. And so what's happening out there is happening inside. And so social inequality writ large affects equity in schools, affects equity in post-secondary. So issues such as citizen st status, um, you know, indigeneity, housing, family income, race, all of those things affect life chances and pathways uh, that as aspiring students see as, as, as viable options. I also think it's a very complex question. I mean, there's many levels to it. There's the macro, the in, in, uh, institutional, um, and then of course, uh, on the micro, personal or familial level. Um, I would say on the institutional level, again, echoing uh, Robin, um, you know, I'd say in my view that systemic and strategic planning can sometimes be pegged to logic models that are based on really outdated archaic and false norms like on the ideal student um, for example some of our enrollment and funding models are based on ideal assumptions um, for example having a very linear 
a linear educational trajectory uh, with no stops or gaps, um, having a dual income household or an incoming student with secure guardianship um, or, or parents, um, assumptions about identity. So um, some of the research suggests that like some of the EQAO tests that students have before coming to, to post-secondary are not suitable for all students because some of the examples in the questions are very culturally mainstream. And so students who come from, um, you know, diasporic communities, Indigenous communities would not ever have any reference to some of the examples in those uh, questions. So I think there's so much to consider here. And, um, you know, of course, on an individual level, I'll say that a parental education, we know, um, you know, the expectations in the household is a determinant of who even sees post-secondary in the future. So um, that's what we kind of characterize as social capital. Um, it's part of social capital. Um, and so many students come in with access to knowledge, resources, finances, uh, that predetermine success, right? Like they, they, it really, the, it, these universities were really catering to those students. Um, and so um, there's a whole range of students that were not considered in the design and development of programs and policies. And so uh, we need to socially engineer that um, now. <laughs> I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Helen. That's a, actually a, a very helpful um, perspective and also segue uh, to our next question. Um, so what does equitable access to education look like in the context of hybrid models? And so I think you raise an interesting um, point about thinking about what does you know, equal access to education for all people of different uh, backgrounds um, look like? And then how does that impact also the, you know, post-COVID world where, you know, education will be a, a hybrid system? And how do we make sure that's something that everyone has equal access to? Um, just to kind of change it up, maybe I'll go over to Andrew first, um, and then maybe we'll do Andrew, Robin, Helen, and then Sam. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I guess the first thing I want to reflect on was uh, it is how when we moved to virtual, like stepping back to the start of COVID, we had a very unexpected experience um, where there was high participation in class, which was very surprising in that, you know, being online and having a chat function, it really democratized the voices. So people who were, you know, naturally very quiet and or people who uh, where English was a second language. Um, they, by it, having a chat function where they could kind of think through a little bit more, or, you know, they could kind of control what they were saying or, or they weren't competing with others. Like it had a very positive effect in terms of actually bringing all those voices forward. Um, and, you know, there was a much more kind of collaboration and cross, cross learning. And those. so that was really, really interesting, um, which is not something I would have expected, but it played out. And so I do want to recognize that you know, for, for the, that there were the, mis the, the things that we dealt with, you know, in terms of, of what we missed from going in person to virtual, but that was something that I really saw that was a win. Um, and then you think about, okay, how can you replicate that once you moved into hybrid? Um, when we think about equitable access in, in terms of the hybrid model, I think they're, you know, the things that remain on the table always, right? Um, in terms of access to, to hardware, software, uh, you know, kind of steady internet, um, having a, like a space to work within a household where they're not interrupted or, or competing priorities in the household that might get kind of in the way. Um, and those are also, those are all important things. The thing I guess that, that in the space that I work that, that I feel like I could control or that we really index on is when you are in this hybrid, hybrid spaces, how do you make sure that you're, you're creating an equal opportunity and an equal engagement style for those who are in person and for those who are virtual? Um, because as we know, the virtual attendees, virtual learners can end up experiencing quite, you know, kind of almost a voyeuristic experience of just looking in where those who are in person with a professor are very immersed. And so that continues to be a question, right? How do you get that balance right? Um, I don't think it's solved. Like I think, you know, I have done some work in, with corporations where they look at, at, at actual physical meetings, like where, how do they manage hybrid meetings versus in-person meetings? And we can put some parameters that help with that. So for instance, if you are doing a hybrid meeting, your facilitator should actually be online because then it helps set the balance between, you know, once you have your facilitator online, it's 
offline or in-person with students with participants, sorry, in a workshop, they end up getting indexed on. And so that's not necessarily going to be the case for a learning environment, but how else, what else can we put in? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've used is actually having um, a co-pilot in classes. So somebody who's actually, while the students receive the, the kind of passive information from the professor through through Zoom or whatever, we do have we have somebody who's actually sit, sitting down with them actively, you know, kind of more experienced TA or, or a professional sitting down and actually encouraging that discussion. So it starts to mimic a little bit or create a different way of engagement. But yeah, that, I think for me that that always comes to the top of my head in terms of equity. How do you make sure that we could let we could kind of correct for the circumstance of people being online versus in person? You raised some uh, interesting points, Andrew. I think um, from my perspective, I've attended classes in person and then I've attended classes solely virtual. They're completely different experiences. And I've also kind of taught classes in both environments, but I've yet to experience what that hybrid um, version will look like. And I think that's probably our future. Just a quick question about the co-pilot thing. So is it that you have a professor and then there's someone that represents the virtual uh, students like during the class and like asks their questions? Is that what that is? Yeah, so there's the, the, you know, we end up, we end up having a teaching team of three. So there's a professor, there's a T, which kind of does what a T usually does. And then there's like a senior, you know, let's call it a senior TE. So that person is in physically in the classroom on a laptop and actually managing the conversation with the students online, with the student group online. And so kind of fielding questions. So they feel like you know, there's somebody who's kind of shepherding and taking care of it. And so it's not just all passive because um, it's hard, right, for a professor to do both, to manage both. So at least it, it starts to manage and kind of cross that bridge a little bit. I, I, I really like that idea. I think that um, we can hear from some of the other participants. So I think it's not really a job that you can assign to the computer, you know, like someone's asking a question, promoting that question, getting a professor. It really is a person that can help bridge that hybrid to in-person a uh, gap. Um, Helen, uh, maybe you can provide your perspective of the future of kind of hybrid learning and what that looks like or the challenges that you think will, will be encountered moving forward. Sure. So um, I can I can speak from my experience be, be living in hybrid uh, mostly, but I haven't, haven't queried students or done any research on this. But my thinking is that, you know, students, especially students who are um, from marginalized groups, are going to campuses because, you know, there there is a sense of um, novelty when you're on campus, there's a sense of connection, you're building social capital capital with with other um, with people who you may not in your own communities, otherwise might may not. So I think there's a loss uh, somewhat of of building community. Um, on the other hand, it has made things more accessible because transit we know is an issue. The cost of um, you know getting to the get actually getting on campus is also an issue. So I think that there are pros and cons to the hybrid model in terms of the students' lives, and that's where I always like to start is how what their day to day looks like. I I also think in terms of cognitive load, going back and forth, like switching functions con constantly has been exhausting for all of us um, during COVID. And so I think how do professors think about designing um, assignments and, and organizing the, the, the learning so that there is some it, it's quite as seamless as possible. And I know, I mean, I'm not an expert in that area. And so I would uh, defer to the experts around um, Around that, about how to design the design the, the actual um, assignments in the classroom, so that it's not uh, you're not flip flopping and going back and forth all the time. Because I would just say, just cognitively, it's exhausting. And this is only for one class, and there's multiple classes that students are taking. Um, I would say that one of the things I worry about is the sense of belonging, like I said, so um, having multiple opportunities and points for connection with faculty, um, peers, it's critical for marginalized students because really this is an opportunity to, to, to connect in new, new ways on new content and um, feeling a sense of place and, and belonging. How do we do that in the hybrid model? How do we do it so it's... it's um, real, that it's sustainable, it's authentic. Um, those are my questions and concerns about it. I don't really have any answers right now. Thanks, Helen. I think 
um, sense of belonging is something that was was challenging even before COVID. Um, coming from you know a school where you have 300 kids in a classroom, have finding a sense of belonging at that stage is actually a challenge. So, in ways, I think maybe virtual kind of makes it feel smaller, but then also you don't have any in person interactions, and so I think it's something that we have to. So we have a challenge, it's the same challenge that's always existed, but we have to approach it and the solution in new, with a new lens. Um, Robin, I think maybe you can provide some of your perspectives on the topic. Sure, and I, I don't know that I can answer the question about how do we make it more equitable. <laughs> what I wanna share instead, because um, I have the unique perspective of coming from the indigenous community and having watched the last two years for indigenous folks. And there's a couple of things that play at least for Indigenous students. Um, you think internet is bad in some places where you live. Um, Six Nations, which is one of the largest reserves that's located right outside of Hamilton, doesn't have viable uh, internet at all in its territory. And it gets even worse wherever you go. Um, so I had a lot of Indigenous students struggle because they couldn't get access. I heard horror stories from some of our students about them, you know, trying to write an exam and they're doing it on their phone in the parking lot at McDonald's because they can't get access and they can't get on campus and all of those things. In fact, at one point I know our university um, amplified its signal so people could come to the parking lot to use internet, right? But that also presumes that they have access to technology and we live in a reality where indigenous peoples remain impoverished at levels of abject poverty that are comparable to some of the poorest regions the, you know the regions we always talk about well we're at least we're not that bad mm, we are that bad and so um and, and that's not just indigenous communities let me be clear on that right but we assume that they have access to resources i mean even with my own children you know i have three kids who were in elementary school and they went into online learning and i looked at my students or principal and I said this is not going to work because I have three kids we do not have three devices and I'm also working virtually and we ended up pulling in my kids out of school if that was the best solution for us as a family and I think for Indigenous students, this has been a real struggle. In fact, we're now seeing it play out in terms of mental health as well. And that's been amplified, of course, by the last year or so and the revealing of all of the graves at residential schools. So COVID and hybrid learning have come together in this horrible, uh, crushing, um, debilitating, you know, just trauma for so many of us and then not being able to access Aboriginal student services. It's still called that at Brock, but we're, we got a name change coming, which is really nice. But that was a, an issue. But another issue that is at play that a lot of people haven't thought about is that it, it, it affects how you teach Indigenous content pedagogically, right? So I'll give you a great example. I have an entire class, it's called Land, Body and Sovereignty, and it's entirely land-based. So I planned all year to teach this land-based class and then March happens. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm told I cannot teach a land-based class. I have to teach it online. Some of the pedagogical, Indigenous pedagogical practices in land-based learning cannot be replicated in that online environment. I tried, I tried, I came up with all kinds of, you know, interesting strategies where I had students still go out on the land and take pictures and document their learning, but it wasn't the same. And so it not only hinders how we teach Indigenous content in the university, but it also hinders the ability of Indigenous instructors to like it influenced how they can pedagogically teach the material. So it becomes this perfect storm where we are committed to indigenization and decolonization and we have indigenous studies, but they're being taught in ways that are really dislocated from um, indig indigenous pedagogical practices like land-based learning. So those are kind of the two things that I really saw play out for indigenous folks in particular, is that there was real issue with access to stable internet, access to spaces to work, access to technology, and then the influence of um, what happens when you go online and have to amend land-based learning into a, a format that does not lend itself to land-based learning. So I think those were my main thoughts about that when looking at this question. Thank you. Um, thanks, Helen, for providing your perspective. I think um, the issue is not a simple one and like hybrid working models, I think it offers some advantages for students. Um, as Andrew pointed out, it gave people that weren't as vocal an opportunity to speak out and give them an opportunity to feel comfortable doing so. 
Um, and then I think Helen offered the perspective that, you know, students can now attend university without having to pay for transportation. And while they do have to pay for hardware, not having to take, not having to commute to school can also provide them with more opportunity and funds to do other things. Um, but now this creates a problem, I guess, in another lens where you can attend school virtually, but if you don't have internet, that's nearly impossible. Um, so I think that it, it solves some problems and creates additional opportunities for equal access, but we're still not at a place where everyone has equal opportunity to attend school, even if it is virtually. Um, Sam, Sam, sorry for the, the long speaking break that I, I gave you there, but maybe from a side of perspective, I think you had some initial, an initial lens on uh, the education system in Ontario based on some statistics. I don't know if you need statistics to speak to this, but anything you have to add or share would be helpful. Uh, sure, yeah. Well, and I don't want to repeat the awesome points that everybody's uh, raised. And so, I mean, other than um, agree with all of it, I think on the internet piece, I'll say that the federal government put in place a $10 in internet uh, plan for low income uh, children, or sorry, low income families with children under the age of 18 um, uh, during the pandemic, which I do think in fairness was like a, um, a solid attempt at uh, uh, dealing with some issues. But as you say, there's no internet available that that doesn't help but on the affordability side I think it did help but it is only for 18 so it doesn't help with post-secondary um and then I think maybe the the um and and I think Andrew's part about the points about the pedagogy um where I was going to raise which are great and um uh maybe I'll just say another kind of lens on the good with the bad is for students with disabilities I think um uh, hybrid learning has in some ways taken down barriers, right? Like physically inaccessible campuses, the ability to record or, um, you know, use your uh, technology in the classroom in a way that, or sorry, use it virtually that you couldn't have done in the classroom. Um, and um, uh, even, you know, speaking of social isolation, people with social anxiety, I think. So I think there's lots of benefits that will come um, in um, uh, professors being forced to learn how to um, even do simple things like record your lecture and put it up on you know D2L or something. Um, all, all that is going to help, um, but it creates other accessibility barriers when professors are doing that in an inaccessible way. And so you know stronger accessibility standards around how to format your documents, your PDFs, um, uh, and how to in ensure that the online learning environment is barrier free. Um, I think it is um, one thing maybe I could add. Um, and then maybe on Helen's point, I just want to say like, as a somebody who teaches, um, I think that the social isolation of the last two years is under appreciated. I don't think the kids are all right. Like I genuinely worry interacting with them now. Like I think that the um, um, uh, time spent, you know, in basements, not having proms, not having boyfriends and girlfriends, like uh, there is just an inherent, we are social people uh, and, you know, our phones can really not um, uh, replicate uh, that time. And I think, yes, of course, pre-pandemic, the 300 person classrooms weren't ideal either, but I think um, I worry a bit about being too cavalier, except for like genuine accessibility reasons, maybe for people with disabilities about hybrid, do whatever you want, when like, is it going to create new issues um, around social, you know, cohesion? Um, I do worry about that. I don't have a good solution, but I just wanted to echo that. Yeah, I think you raised a good point, uh, Sam, as well. Like, hybrid creates a lot more access for people that wouldn't have had access before and is easier for people with disabilities, but it also creates an opportunity for people that, you know, would have attended a class in person to sort of be there, but be checked out. I think as a, um, a TA, that's a challenge that I faced, like I would attend a class in person and be able to see who's learning, who's asking questions and who's engaged. And I think that virtually as an instructor, I think people were just there to, to take the quiz. And so like, how, how, how do you balance both of those things, you know, providing access for people, but then also making sure they're, that you're providing quality education that's not based off of just, you know, going through the virtual multiple choice quiz. And I think, um, I don't think there was a solution for it yet, but I think that's something that to keep in mind is not to make everything hybrid to increase like accessibility and forget, you know, yeah. that there is a value to being a person where possible. Um, so the next question I'd like to 
I'll bring about is when we think about how Black, Indigenous, and racialized students are currently supported in their application and admission process to post-secondary, in what ways do we think that we can build more of an inclusive admissions process to combat inequality? Um, I think that perhaps Robin, you maybe want to kick us off here and then uh, Helen, Andrew, and Sam can chime in. I think you had a, a great perspective on, you know, uh, people in Indigenous communities. They can, they are enrolled, obviously, and I think, um, but they aren't given the tools to do so. But is there something we can do in the application process to better support them uh, to make sure that they sure. are even given absolutely. an opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, this is something that, um, you know, was mentioned earlier, I, I think Helen mentioned about EQAO, that the language and the applications itself can be biased towards particular communities, you know, things I think about, like the expectation of a standard route to university, all of those things apply here. But I think the struggle, at least for Indigenous students, is still so many of us are uh, first generation students. So we are approaching these things with out any real background, at least familial background, and and how do you apply? Like, what's a transcript? How do you do this? You know, I have to, you know, I have to provide this information. What does that look like? And I see a lot of our students really struggle with that. And we see that what has or what's necessary, at least for Indigenous students, and we actually have a devoted staff person, a recruiter, an advisor who helps with this in the Indigenous stu uh, students center is that they help people walk through the process because it is challenging you know what they're being asked for they're not necessarily aware of what that is they don't know how to access those things you know people don't necessarily straight think strategically about references and then we have to help with that you know even just having access to a system because you know most of our systems now are online <laughs> again it comes back to do you have access to your computer do you have access to internet and what happens when you get certain what happens when and you need help, you know, if, if our students, I, I will say this, you know, Indigenous students struggle um, because we often feel like the mainstream system doesn't work for us and we're distrustful and rightfully so uh, because we have been mistreated by post-secondary institutions, whether by research, whether by, you know, we and that continues, whether, you know, as students, all of those things. So I find that they need Indigenous folks to help walk the journey with them. I think that really matters. And so that means that we need more people who are indigenous in admissions. We need more indigenous people in recruiting and we need student support who are indigenous themselves who can help our students walk through that. It really makes a difference. I was really, a, a friend of mine said something once that really, I just went, this is it. You know, um, she said, the reason why friendship centers work is because it's a central little there's a central location and everything the person needs is right there so if you need to do one thing you can go here and then we just send you across the hall those kinds of things and we need to kind of create those systems for our students within the universities because unfortunately a lot of our students as soon as there's like a barrier or like a next step it's so much easier for so many of us to be like you know what maybe this isn't for me and i'm gonna buzz off right and i'm not gonna do this so to me that's what really needs to happen is we really need to think strategically about you know who's in the admissions office who's doing advising who is doing recruitment and how are we representing the groups that are marginalized you know how do we represent indigenous folks how do we make sure that bipoc folks are represented in all of those how do we have, you know, folks who have accessibility needs there that can help, uh, you know, students with accessibility needs manage that system? It's like we need navigators. I mean, even sometimes as a senior administrator, I'm still trying to figure out the map of the university and who you need to talk to to do things, right? So if I feel that way, our students feel that way. And we need to make sure not only that we're represented, but that there's a way for folks to have support as they navigate those systems and access to, you know, whether it's an advisor, whether it's somebody who can sit down with them at a computer and help them go through the process, help them, you know, look at the terminology. We just need more support in all of this. I think from the perspective, I think, you know, the question focuses on inclusive in the admissions process, but what you highlight is the challenges that the students face when they like are, are like at the university or when the application is already in but perhaps the problem is much larger and it starts before they even apply and like the the solution there can't can't just be the university alone um 
because if you don't value a post-secondary education, you don't have a computer, you can't even apply. Um, so I think that's a, a much greater issue than probably we can even just focus on within admissions, um, perhaps, but perhaps that's maybe um, where our speakers today come from and, you know, any step towards it is still beneficial. Um, Helen, Andrew, or Sam, do either of you want to kind of chime in uh, next off of Robin's point? I guess I'll say just that, um, I mean, co-sign everything Robin said and that, you know, representation is so important. So seeing people that look like you that have completed the program, I'll never forget, you know, a student coming up to me saying, oh, you look like my cousin, you know, and I was, you know, an administrator at George Brown College at the time. And it meant so much to her to see someone in leadership that looked like her. And so I think just we can't under, uh, under, undersell that piece. Uh, I think embeddedness in community. So every, I truly do believe it starts way earlier than the time of application. So every student should know about, or potential students should know about all the universities um, in community when they're in middle school. You know, and they should know what a university is. They should know what an application process is. Um, you know, if, if I'm going to build my own ideal and why it's important, you know, and I think we're starting it a bit too late. I know that there was a provincial program, um, provincially funded program, Life After High School, um, that supported students to apply in high schools. And they believe they waived af application fees as well. But interventions like that are really important, although I believe that was in grade 11 or 12, if I'm not mistaken, much earlier. We need to talk about it much earlier. Um, um, so that by the time they get there, it's really just a matter of logistics, you know, and it's really just getting their ducks in a row. It's not actually wrapping their head around the mammoth that is a university. I'll also just say that we need to be very thoughtful about how we decline students as well. So like the actual communication with students. So the letters that they receive when I was at HECO, we actually um, we're testing, doing a, a sort of a double blind study on Dr. Christine Logel, who's out in Renison College. Um, uh, intervention that she was testing was um, something, oh, sorry, I may have misspoken. Uh, well, I believe she was on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the research team for sure. I believe it is hers. Psychologically attuned um, decline letters. And what that really means is thinking through how the student is going to receive it and really customizing the decline letter or maybe giving some opportunities uh, for that student. So I haven't seen the decline letters um, at UT, for example, but I would be really interested in like, you know, is this person way off or is there, are there things that can just be uh, attuned for the next year? But thinking about how we're communicating with students from a brand, from a you know, brand perspective really matters and it matters for whether they're gonna reapply if they don't get in the first time. So um, it's it's really from the beginning to the end that we need to think about um, customizing the processes. Maybe I'll jump in. Um, I agree about financial barriers and I was gonna also mention the admission fees, but I think it's broader than that too, the OSAP, um, you know, program and, um, you know, I think I think the, the free tuition program that was in place for low income students and then it's kind of subsequent dismantling, I do think that culture was sort of changing about um, the financial barriers and that that's now backslid, which um, I think is um, a huge problem because you're not gonna apply if you don't think you can afford it. Um, but, but I would also just echo that the problems start much, much earlier than um, uh, the application process. Um, we know that racialized students, especially boys, are much more likely to be expelled or suspended, are much more likely to be deemed uh, problematic or put into special education programs or vocational programs, um, all of which cut you off from applying um, to university. Um, so again, I do think um, ending streaming, um, at least in grades nine and 10, so that students of all abilities are together learning, which by the way, every other province does. And um, we're the only province in Canada that starts streaming in grade nine and many only stream some courses. Um, you know, for example, many provinces never stream English. English is always in one stream. Um, so um, I think delaying the amount of time um, uh, before uh, people have to start thinking about their uh, post-secondary pathway um, will allow um, uh, for more equitable outcomes. Um, and then I think, you know, coming from U of T, for particular programs, you know, U of T's medicine program, which had 
huge equity issues did basically like an affirmative admission strategy for black students. I think um, there's a place for that where there's kind of um, systemic uh, targeted challenges. So um, I think there's lots of work to be done on this topic. So I, I guess just in a way of wrapping up, which exact it's very much what I had kind of thought about is from that from a design perspective, um, and that it is a journey, right? It's a complete end-to-end -end customer journey that if we if we really consider our students as customers of us of our learning institutions. And so yeah, there's absolutely the before, and there that before is as we've said, way before even considering the application it's the envisioning and embracing the possibility and even being aware that there is a possibility for this thing um, which might be very distant for many especially if, if you have there are no first generation kind of university educated folks so i think there's something even you know how do we start all the way there there is the fact that you know programs look for whether it's community participation or leadership like you can't do that in the last year so how do you you support that, right? And you get people, you get pot potential applicants to really start being involved in in in, in uh, co-curricular activities, and so that they can at least start building that up. Because um, of course, if, if if having an inclusive uh, application process is pointless, if you actually don't have candidates that you've helped get there. For the during, I mean, I think a lot of folks in this room might be, you know, there's a lot of Good research, good data around um, DNI and, and creating more equitable pr practices and procedures within the application process. One thing I'd like to see, and I'm not haven't seen it yet, is the ways in which we assess and we value experiences. So, you know, even looking at something like community involvement, what community involvement might mean in an indigenous community, for instance, where it's not, you know, underneath uh, a big name institution or well recognized brand. Why, how, how can we encourage ourselves to value those two experiences similarly? And not just because it's something that's recognizable, right? Like, or that we have always deemed as being valuable. So I think there's something a lot in terms of stepping back from the system and being like, what are we deeming to be valuable? And then how are we assessing that value? I think we're, I'm seeing that that's not done. Um, and then the after, so you've applied, you've gone through, I think there's a really interesting moment after. So, which is, for these folks who have gone through successfully from marginalized communities, how do we get them back into the system? How do we make them, you know, do coaching, mentorship, ambassadorship? How do we give them a seat at the table and a recruiting table, right? And so we create a we create a cyclical ecosystem that it's 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 a pay back and forth and it and it sustains itself and it's again an end to end journey that's that's fostering and bringing in the next generation. So I think just generally when we think when we're thinking of any experiences like this. Always, we should encourage ourselves to think of what's before, what's during, and what's after. And initiatives across all of them are likely to be more successful than just focusing on any one section of it. I thank you to all of you. I think you highlight um, kind of, you know, that there's the problems quite complex. Uh, like, as Robin was saying, a lot of students are of the first generation, so they um, don't have parents supporting that process um, or, you know, community mentors supporting their applications university or providing value in terms of why they should apply. And I think that nicely echoed what Helen then highlighted, the fact that, like, representation is so important. Um, if you don't know or don't value this university you're not going to apply and, and know you need to do that so the problem does actually start a lot earlier and then when you're there staying in university it's not like you have someone back home in your ear telling you why it's valuable and what it can provide you with so having mentors and leaders within your community at school can actually be kind of a sounding board and like why you should stay stay in school um i think at this point in in the session we're going to transition into the questions from the audience um i will kind of try to parallel them with maybe some of the questions we had before uh, that I didn't cover and try to make sure we touch on a bunch of different topics. Um, the first question comes from our audience as, as the most folks. Um, actually, before I do that, let me remind everyone that's attending to, to go to slido.com and then you can add um, your questions there or about the ones that we do have. 
Um, I will ask Amon to just put the slide link back in the chat just in case you haven't gotten there. Well, we do have some questions here. Uh, the first question relates to something that we uh, talked about at the beginning about uh, decolonializing education systems. And so um, the question is, how can we decolonialize education systems while acknowledging that it still can be a, pro a powerful tool for operating in the current capitalist system that we are entrenched in? So this is probably like uh, getting to that point of, you know, what are the issues within university and how can we move towards decolonializing them without, um, you know, there, are, there is value to the education system, but what can we do the first steps to really changing that? Well, Robin, since you brought that up, maybe I'll ask you to start and then we'll ask the others to chime in if they have anything to add. Sure, and I have to tell you, that's what I do every day is think this question through, so I appreciate it. I see it kind of as a two, because I too, I mean, I benefited greatly from pursuing um, post-secondary education. It's changed my life in ways I can't imagine. And so I don't want to dismiss it. I think there is value in having in educated Indigenous peoples who know the systems, who are able to work within them. I think in terms of how do we decolonize post-secondary, it, it's two, there's two journeys that have to happen and they have to happen simultaneously. We have to create greater space for Indigenous folks in the universities and that means on a few levels. It means we need to create pathways uh, and, and support for Indigenous students to come to university. I think that's the very first step because without students this is all a, a moot point, right? Um, we really need to find pathways and we have to recognize that Indigenous learners, um, not are, they aren't necessarily the same as your mainstream learners. So we need to find really specific ways and work with Indigenous folks to identify what that looks like. And, you know, sometimes it means creating, you know, I hate the term bridging program. I, I'm trying to come up with something better, but creating pathways for indigenous students who maybe, you know, maybe they don't have exactly what was needed to get in, but we can create the, the space for them, not only to upgrade, but also see themselves and support them with mentorship and, and coaching and all of those things. But, that doesn't matter if we don't have Indigenous faculty. So you need to have Indigenous folks and you need to have them, you know, just not, not, not just in faculty. I will say students have said to me that having an Indigenous person as a senior administrator has been so meaningful for them because all of a sudden, you know, that world opened up to them and they were like, wow, you could do that too? That's amazing. Um, but we need staff, we need all of those people. We need indigenous students to see themselves at all levels of the university. So that's really critical. It also means that we have to look at decolonizing the pedagogy and the curriculum. So that means two things. That means creating space for indigenous ways of knowing and being in the classroom and recognizing that there are different ways of learning outside of the Western system that can be really beneficial to students. You know, I even look at things like ungrading, this whole phenomenon that's being discussed right now in circles. And I'm like, Indigenous people have been doing that for a really long time. I'm just going to say that for <laughs> experiential ed learning. And I'm like, we've been doing that for a really long time, right? I think those are the things that happen, have to happen, right? But here's the other thing. You can't do all of those things and leave anti-Indigenous racism and colonial practices in place. You cannot do that. So we can create and craft a way in and create space for Indigenous peoples. But if they're coming onto campus and they're experiencing hatred, or they're coming into classes where their professors are saying, oh, you're Indigenous, so you teach the class about this Indigenous content when they're there to learn, or they're confronting horrible stereotypes that, that professors are advancing, or students for that matter, or you know all of those things. You know, we can't have that if we want Indigenous students and then staff and faculty to feel comfortable on campus, then we actually actively have to address anti-Indigenous racism and colonialism. And we have to look at how it is really insidious, how it happens every day, sometimes in great explosive ways, but most times it's microaggressions on the everyday level. We need to address both of those things because you know what I'm gonna tell you straight up, as somebody who is doing this right now on the ground at a university, for every step forward I take, and we are making huge strides, I end up, almost inevitably taken a couple steps back because I have indigenous anti-racism and colonialism 
you know, rearing its ugly head and, and fighting the changes that we're trying to make. And so we have to fight those two things. And I really think, you know, one of the brave things I think my university did that hasn't been done so much around Canada is we completed a climate survey. Um, and we we found out very clearly that our students, our faculty and our fac our, our student staff and faculty who are Indigenous experience those things every single day. And there's one stat that sticks out in my head, and that's that 37% of our Indigenous students had uh, had seriously considered leaving the university in the previous year. And so what I kept saying to the my team at, at the university and, and senior admin and everybody is that's the fact that should scare us. And that's the fact that we should be investigating and finding out what it is that makes our students not want to stay. And I'm going to say it's not, you know, certainly there's going to be personal issues. You know, there's going to be family demands. There's going to be community demands. There's going to be, you know, not feeling like the program is right. I get that. But I also think the climate survey drew attention to the fact that there is anti-Indigenous racism on campus. There is colonialism, that these structures don't necessarily feel comfortable nor safe for our students, nor do they really respect and acknowledge Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And I think that's really critical. I, I will say one thing, you know, I'm really proud of Brock for is that we are the first university in Canada to have in our collective agreement, the recognition of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous ways of knowing and being as being treated on par with a PhD. And that's the first collective agreement in the country to have that in place. And I think that's really important because it opens the door for for us to create spaces where our ways of knowing and being are included and they're not just done in a token way they are being you know grounded into the faculty and, and and into the institution and I think that's really important but it really is two things to me when I hear reconciliation I'm like no 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 this is indigenization so making space for indigenous folks and decolonizing and those two things have to happen together if not it's it, it, we can make little progresses, but uh, we're still, those successes are going to be limited. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, I'm going to provide an opportunity for Sam, Andrew, and Helen to maybe add their thoughts on this. Um, if there's nothing, if you think that Helen, or sorry, Robin covered it, we can, we can move on to the next question. I just I do, I do think Rodman has covered it. The only thing a nuance I want to add is that, you know, we use words like decolonization and then we get caught up on the lingo. And what, all I want to say is that it's it's actually starts with us as leaders. Um, it really starts with us interrogating our own assumptions and and it's quite subtle so having a colonial perspective could be as simple as you know i'll give you an example when i was in my in my third year of philosophy um we're handing in our essays and the professor invites everyone out for a beer which is great but there's a couple of things he missed there i mean it was well intentioned but a couple of things when i look back on it you know from in my culture, I mean, sitting with your professor is actually seen as a sign of disrespect. You don't treat them as a peer, right? So not to say that he needs to understand and know that, but there are things that happen that exclude people very unintentionally. And let's also mention that if there was, there wasn't, but if there was a hijabi or a Muslim person in the classroom, how comfortable would it be for them to, to, to be at a bar? So simple things like that, um, we, we really just need to understand how we might be excluding people. Um, there's also in terms of social capital, we make assumptions about the type of social capital and assets that people are bringing on campus and in the classroom. Um, for example, a good friend of mine who was um, Indigenous, we met, you know, we met in first year, her uncle was chief in her community. She was always, ex always expected that she would be a lawyer. That's what she did. She had social capital. It just didn't look like what we think social capital should look like or um and she's a very powerful woman now in her career so it's just about interrogating our own assumptions sometimes and we live in in a very global community and we sometimes are have uh, quite narrow assumptions about uh who the people are that are uh, that are on campus and in our classrooms i just want to add on extend it out a little bit um and so that's certainly within the ecosystem of the school itself. I think one thing that I need, you know, it's worth keeping in mind is, well, as with all these things, is approaching things with a system perspective and a systems view. And so why do I bring that up? It's you think of 
that's you know a very realistic thing of university funding. And we've seen that pop up as issues multiple times, right? You know, university funding affects what deans and leadership teams do, which then affect the structures that fall between that come underneath. And so I'm not offering up a solution, but what I'm saying is, you know, the, the, there's always going to be the higher level. Like, you know, if you have extreme resistance from, let's say, a big funder who's like, nope, I don't believe in that. And therefore, if you do that, I'm going to pull like, Yes, we know it shouldn't exist, but that's a reality we deal with, right? In systems that are not isolated and independent. And so how do we consider those things? You know, it, I think of this a lot, given that we're in a business school, right? Like where I'm situated, like it's, it's a very particular capitalist context. And it's really, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of good intentions and a lot of, of, of efforts being made but you do run into the tension and you do run into those headwinds sometimes. And so thinking about things in the entire ecosystem, and again, just like with a student experience, you know, before, middle, after, like what's the before, middle, after and around in contexts like these? Because um, there are other areas that, that affect these decisions. Uh, thank you uh, to Robin, Helen, and Andrew for writing your perspective on this point. I think that there's like like multiple layers here, um, as Andrew highlighted before, before, during, and after. I think Kellen sometimes, you know, professors aren't necessarily given awareness to the fact that you know what can seem like a well-intentioned gesture is actually becoming a very exclusive environment for the students in the class. And so maybe it's as simple as raising awareness about it, um, but at the same time like big change will be determined by like university funding and who at the end of the day is what the preferences of the business or whoever's providing funding at the school is and has. Um, we have another upvoted question from our audience. Um, this one is, what expectations do you have from the new Ford government when it comes to education? What advice would you give them in this area? And I think this is an interesting opportunity to think maybe beyond um, I know it's a conversation about, about post-secondary education, but as we highlighted earlier, maybe a lot of the issues actually start a lot earlier when it is when it comes to like EQAO or access to education, understanding of what university or college can actually provide. Uh, maybe I'll pass it um, off to Sam here to kick us off, and then we can hear from the remainder. Sure. I mean, I don't have high expectations. Um, I don't think that they have demonstrated in their first term a deep commitment uh, to education. I think the pandemic forced uh, their hand in some respects in, in requiring certain investments, um, but uh, their track record before um, the pandemic uh, was, you know, one of cuts. And so, um, yeah, I don't have super high hopes, but I will say um, <clears throat> that, and, and I should also say, you know, and to the extent they have focused, they focus on the skilled trades, which I think is great, actually, and, and probably kind of long overdue, but it has actually often been um, communicated in a way that's, you know, anti-university uh, and, and, uh, and pro-skilled um, trades, which, which I think is too bad. Um, and so um, having said all that, I do think you saw some signs from Minister Lecce, the Minister of Education, um, that to the extent things didn't cost money, they were willing to um, uh, make some positive change. So they committed to end streaming between academic and, and applied courses in grade nine. Um, uh, they have committed to um, race-based data collection in all school boards um, by 2023, which, you know, sunshine can be a powerful tool um, um, and, you know, knowing huge gaps in the representation of teachers, the overrepresentation among students getting suspended or in French immersion schools or, or you know, the, the myriad ways that the K-12 education system can be uh, uh, racist and oppressive. Um, uh, that transparency can um, force local conversations and local change sometimes, not always, but um, so I think um, if I was giving them advice, knowing that they're unlikely to change course and invest heavily in education, I think I might focus on those more structural things that are free around um, uh, data, um, um, the structure of curriculum, human rights frameworks, um, things that 
can hopefully see local change. Um, thanks, Sam. I think you raise a good point. Uh, if there's a low expectation in terms of what can be committed in terms of funding, there are always to gather the data to make a change potentially in the future or to prioritize which things uh, need to be thought about. Um, Andrew, Helen, or Robin, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this point? I would, I definitely, because I've been working at the senior men level on this, and I see two things that I think are going to continue. One of which I find very, very scary, which is that uh, funding for universities will be tied to performance-based indicators. And some of those key performance indicators uh, really work against um, creating um, equitable environments at the university. If we're just looking at numbers and not uh, anything else, I'm really concerned and, I, and I'm really concerned about, you know, how differential sized universities will be able to respond. I'm worried about how this will represent groups that don't necessarily have access to university. I think that's kind of a, it's a scary way I've seen them going, but the pressure is gonna mount, I think, now that they've had this second mandate. The other side, though, that I think could be really interesting is I think, um, as far as I'm aware, they're going to continue their focus on micro credentials. I think that's a really interesting strategy um, at Brock. We're mobilizing that to actually create opportunities for land based learning and stackable credentials that would then be transferable into a university degree. So we're looking at that as an opportunity to bring Indigenous ways of knowing and being into the university. I am a little concerned, though, because they, they do these little one offs where they ask you to contribute and develop curriculum and then they want to hold on to the curriculum and let people use it all over and I'm I worry about what that does around Indigenous ways of knowing and being but I do think that's a really interesting way to for, I'm going to just speak for Indigenous folks to have an entry point for us into university because a lot of one thing I've learned over my years of working with Indigenous communities is we really like certificates we love to go do a certificate but very few institutions have figured out a way to make those things stackable so that you can work towards a degree when you as you have these certificates and I think they're really important if, if we can overcome that little piece, then I think what we could do is create doors for Indigenous students to see themselves at the university. So they come and do a certificate, say, in how to tan hide, and then understand that that could be a way into the university. And they're like, wow, I really could see myself here. That could be an entry point. So I kind of like that. I'm a little worried about what that means long term, but uh, I, I think that's interesting. And I do think um, the Ford government will continue really amping up its support for college. And I think that's important. You know, my first, I didn't go straight to university. I went to, a, 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 I actually went to a hybrid university college because that was the most accessible to me given my family's income and location and things like that. And I think, you know, the investment in trades is really important. I know there will probably be more investment in nursing. And I think those things are valuable as well. But I don't know about how EDI and indigenization and decolonization will play out in all of that. So I'm going to stop there. Um, just a quick question, uh, Robin. When you mentioned uh, KPI-based funding, is that how the funding is distributed uh, to colleges and universities based off of like their performances? Not yet, but it, okay. he. It, I think the pandemic derailed that in many ways because then all of a sudden there was like so many other crises to worry about but given that this is the pandemic I mean it's not gone it's still happening very much so right but I think they'll return to that focus and say okay the funding you receive from us is going to be developed or dependent on your demonstrated um you know success in these key performance areas so I, I i can't imagine that ford is going to back away from that and so i i would i'm interested to see how it develops oh, that's helpful i'm going to pause there in case anyone wants to add anything to this question all right um so we received a question about um folks in low-income communities and i think that maybe i'll dovetail that into one that we've previously prepared so uh, when thinking about students coming from low income communities, in what ways are they currently underserved in their academic journey? And I know we've probably touched on a couple of these already. I mean, how can this be improved? And then our audience asked the question um, as a potential way of improvement. When we think about low income communities um, and those in those communities, graduate programs currently cost upwards of $100,000 in many instances. Um, what would you think about a merit based tuition system? So 
hand it over to the panelists. Um, understanding people from low income communities and what ways can we better serve them is merit based tuition something that would be beneficial. So I can offer up a perspective as far as um, supporting low income students from low income communities on their academic journey. Um, as this is probably a little bit of a different view than people might expect, but it's a recognition of how closely tied um, a social journey through university is to academic success. You know, just being able to have a peer, peer group, having support within your peer group, you know, even just the, the comfort of working with people. And, you know, there's so much that's so closely tied into having a good university experience and people who actually do well. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, how might we consider the for low income students from low income communities who are either being excluded, one, because of perception, stigmas, biases, or are being excluded because they just don't have the finances to, you know, go to the bar or go to the movies or whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, it's, I think it's an interesting question to pose, right? It's, it's, is it maybe outside of the traditional boundaries of learning institutions? Yes. Is it something we might have to consider to do? Yes, if we really want to, you know, kind of create um, more, more equitable playing fields is how do we, how might we be able to foster some of these social interactions and, and, and build community? Um, and of course that dovetails of course into like, well, especially with virtual and all that, but I think recognizing that there is an element of community and socialization that interplays with academic performance and, and that, 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 that is one way I think that, that inequity shows up. Um, and we raise a very interesting point about um, for students in low income communities, it impacts their ability to socialize and become a part of the community. Um, is there something that you think would help with that um, at, at an institutional level? Is it about um, how much OSAP funding students are given to kind of give them like a better ability to have a little bit more funding to be able to participate in the social environment? Um, or how, are, how are ways that like we as a community can think about that. I mean, so I can speak to some, you know, a couple of the micro things that we have done. Um, you know, so for instance, even on when we were doing all virtual is that we would actually build in just a little bit of kind of connection time at the start and the back end of classes, you know, so we'd have the, the we would start up maybe 10, 15 minutes before we'll have music playing in the back in, in the virtual room. Um, encourage students to just kind of go and meet and connect with each other, like at least it starts creating opportunities for them to connect. Um, and similarly, the back end. So that's a very micro way. Another very micro way is, but you do need to have funding for it. We've taken like Tim bits and coffee into the classroom and just encourage folks to just hang out for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after class, like with no expectation. So instead of the onus of time and resource being outwards, can we provide a context and a setting for it? Um, so that's as much as, you know, I think on a bigger scale, um, you know, can you do kind of student engagement programs and foster things like, you know, interclass or inter, you know, kind of mirroring intermural kind of within classrooms to try and get folks uh, to engage with each other in different ways and, and build those relationships. So, you know, but a lot of it, I think, is, of course, going to be a funding challenge, right? Um, and so it's a matter of making a priority off of it and saying, look, we do have this onus and responsibility to foster communication and collaboration and community building within our, our core classes um, and our cohorts. And, and it's a commitment that we take on as, as educational institutes, institutions. That's a great point, Andrew. I think perhaps I, I my, I personally had kind of undervalued or didn't think about how the programs of like opportunities to build connections provided by university actually create a more equal playing field because everyone has, you know, equal opportunity to attend if you're not charged for an event, if you're not, you know, needing to take your, so, like, your ability to join the community off campus or into something that's going to cost you more money. Um, Sam, I noticed you unmuted your mic, so is there something you kind of want to add to this point about Thinking about students from low-income communities and how we can better serve like, them in their academic journey. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I maybe just wanted to react to the um, the question about about financial barriers um, and merit based uh, tuition. And I don't know if the person who posed the question wants to add any more context um, in the chat or something. But um, my, um, I'll say, I think Ontario used to have in the free tuition program quite an effective um, approach uh, to eliminating financial barriers uh, for students that was taken away by the Ford government. Um, uh, and, you know, it only existed for one year in 2018, but the evidence is that single mothers, low-income students, Indigenous students all um, took it up significantly more than in the year before. Um, and in general, from what I know of the research on merit-based aid is that it disproportionately benefits white high income students because they are the ones who've successfully navigated their way through the K-12 system and have the highest grades. Um, and so generally the advocacy is to move away from merit-based um, aid and scholarships and, and put that money into need-based um, uh, uh, aid. So I don't know if that's what the questioner is getting at, but um, that's what I thought I'd offer. I would love to echo my support for need be need based funding because I'm going to tell you, I think it's criminal to force people to go into debt that they it's next to impossible to get discharged so that they can get ahead in the world and still be behind the ball because they're now carrying thousands of dollars worth of debt that other students with privilege with money with access don't have to carry into their post-secondary life without them. I think that is absolutely cr criminal. And if we want to talk about performance-based, that might be the place where I would say, you know what, if somebody goes to school, finish, they use student loans, they finish their program, wipe their debts. You're going to get the benefit of that education and training in so many myriad ways. You know, putting students in debt to have this is a point of privilege that is still an access point that is very, very privileged. I think, you know, one of the programs that I'm really, you know, in support of, for example, is the 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 um, waiver of tuitions for students who have been in the custody of the state. I mean, that's one group, for example, that really benefits from a needs based model because they don't have parental support. They don't have access to resources. And I think that's a really great way to address that. I think more needs based is important because if we can eliminate the amount of debt that students have to incur to be able to go to university, we then set them up to have better life chances instead of, you know, facing paying, you know, $1,000 a month back to their student loans for 10 years or something like that. I just, to me, I, I have to tell you the whole system of the student loan system to me, well, it gave me access to university that I wouldn't, I would never have had. I, you know, I just think the idea of forcing people who were already economically marginalized into even greater debt so they can try to get ahead of the world is absolutely criminal. All right, thank you so much, Robin, um, for adding your perspective on that question. Um, we are at time, but before we wrap the event, I think Sam, Andrew, Robin, and Helen, is there any like final thoughts that you'd like to pass off to the audience to take away? Okay, I think we all had a very engaged and lively discussion. I certainly learned a lot um, about the education system and then making sure that BIPOC Indigenous people have an opportunity to participate, whether it be in the application pro process during school, whether it be a hybrid opportunity, or even uh, creating opportunity for low income students to really have a seat at the table. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this event, specifically Sam Andrew, Andrew Supersad. Robin Bourgeois and Helen Tawaddle. Um, you guys provided an excellent and diverse perspective from different post-secondary education systems throughout the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And then before I see some people signing off, so I'd just like to let you know that before we close the call, you'll see a poll come up on your screen to share some very quick feedback about this event. We hope that you stay engaged with the ELN from here. The best way to do so is to make sure you're subscribed to the ELN newsletter and to first find out about new events and opportunities. You'll see a link in the chat to join us if you haven't already. With that, I'd like to give our panelists the opportunity to sign off. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at this event and for supporting the Emerging Leaders Network. For our participants still on the call, if you have any questions, 
um, we'll stay on the call. So you can just drop them into the chat if you have anything.